trust and obey. Uh, we'll sing this uh, with some tempo, uh, and we'll sing uh, all five verses. Trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and Good evening, saints. If you want to open up your uh, bulletins, we'll go over a few things together. The dates for Oregon Family Camp, Virginia Family Camp, and uh, the ladies' advance at Lake James are all um, written there. You can uh, take a look at those if you need more information. Uh, you can feel free to uh, see me or see Mr. Harbor. I'm sure that uh, we can provide you with some more details. There's a joint Friday night fellowship um, going on in Lima on March 1st. That's for ages 12 to 18, and we're leaving the building at 530. Uh, we should be back to the building uh, between 1045 uh, and 11 o'clock uh, that evening. The Spring Spiritual Warriors Fellowship is April 12th and 13th, ages 12 to 18. Um, there's a registration on that, so make sure that you're registered. Make sure the kids that are planning on coming uh, are registered. Mental health first aid starts at 8.30 here at the building in uh, the room that we call the library. It's where we have our men's meeting. Uh, so that's at 8.30 this coming Saturday. Even if you didn't come last week, you're welcome to come. Uh, this week is what Mr. Harbor said, and that goes until 1 o'clock. Anything else that we should be announcing? Mission of the month is uh, Adam's Kosovo trip. Um, Thanksgiving, thankful for the Sunday school teachers, thankful for the cleaners. Uh, really grateful and thankful for the job that everybody uh, does with that cleaning, the, um, the carpets and 
uh, bathrooms and everything like that really does make a big difference. Uh, Natalie and her uh, certification, uh, Dawn and her acceptance into school, Dean and Denise's safe travel, glad to have them uh, back here with us, Datha and her recovery, she's looking great, Rosa, Kirsten and her promotion, Jeremy and his family coming. I also have an update on Jeremiah. They finally got the test results back, uh, and everything is good there. Uh, it turns out that it was an infection, and the family doctor didn't think that the infection would last uh, that long, which is why they had it tested. But there's no cancer or anything like that. It's just an infection, and they're going to try and, try and get it cleared up. So thankful for that. It was good to see Steve here uh, on Lord's Day. He said that he worked the whole week. It was, uh, it was rough, but he was able to power through, so thankful that he's uh, doing better. Personally thankful that uh, Mike uh, Netter is able to be uh, with us here uh, this evening. Uh, I know his schedule is a little bit different this week because he's getting some training down in Fenley, so thankful for his uh, safe travel and uh, able to be at the assembly on Sunday, which is Sunday night, which is not normal because he's usually working second shift. So I was very happy to see that. <clears throat> what other thank yous do you guys have? I guess I got another, I got another thank you too. I was thankful that uh, none of the branches came down on the car or the house. Uh, they came down all over the yard and everywhere else, but not on the car or the house. So it was, it was awesome. What else we got? Keep the Shelley Rex family in your prayers. Uh, Francisco Ramirez and his citizenship. Louise, Will Newcomb, uh, Natalie and her broken um, heel, I think. Uh, Datha, Sue Brock, Jesse Puente. Uh, Bill, should we put you on the thank yous? I have you written here. So... Bill's a thank you. Um, Mike Nagy, uh, continue to keep him in your prayers as he's having to come off of uh, a lot of medication and has painful process for him. So keep Mike in your prayers. Keep the Chickering family in your prayers. Uh, Rick, in particular, is looking for work. And Nancy, uh, Nancy is uh, having some health difficulties. So keep them in your prayers. Do you have an update there? Okay. I don't have any slips up here. Did anybody have any additions? All right. If not, let's uh, have a prayer. Great and glorious Heavenly Father, I'm grateful and thankful for this day. I'm thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together uh, on a midweek. I'm thankful for um, the... The way that you have the church set up, that you don't do things um, arbitrarily, that you do things very much on purpose, Lord God, and I'm grateful and thankful that you have those things set up uh, for our benefit and that we get, to, we get to benefit from those things, Lord God. Lord, I'm grateful and thankful for the encouragement uh, and the stimulation of the saints. Father, I pray that we would really work hard to uh, encourage one another to uh, to be uh, service-oriented, Lord God, to have uh, the type of servant's heart um, asking what we can do to be pleasing to you and to um, serve others for the cause of Jesus, Lord. And I just uh, am grateful and thankful for that overall uh, attitude here in the congregation. Father, I am thankful that uh, Bill's procedure went well, and I'm just uh, grateful and thankful for uh, his uh, faithful service, Lord God. I just uh, pray that you would be with Mike. Lord, I pray that you would be with um, his health, and I know it's been a long struggle for a long time, and I just pray that you would uh, be with him. I pray that you would be with Rick and Nancy. I pray that Rick would be able to uh, find some employment, Lord, and I just uh, pray that you would be with Nancy's health. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless uh, the, the rest of our assembly time, that uh, the name of Jesus might be lifted up and that we would really uh, dive into your word, Lord God, to see what uh, encouragement that we can receive uh, from you. 
that we would see what kind of exhortation that we can receive, where we can grow, where we can make changes, where we can really put on the character of Christ uh, to a greater degree. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 909. 909, there's a fountain free. Nine zero nine. We'll sing all three verses of this. There's a fountain free tis for you and me. Let us raise so haste to its spring. Tis a fountain of love from the source of love, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come? be turning in your Bibles to Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans chapter 12. In this world, it can start to feel like good doesn't even have a chance. It can start to feel like that evil is so prevalent, so strong, the darkness is so thick, that good, really, the odds are stacked against it. Good Good can't even play by the same rules as evil. Good can't lie, murder, steal, swindle, deceive, twist. Good can't do any of those things or use any of those tools that are at the disposal of evil. Evil can use... All of those tools. And there's all sorts of phrases in our society that express this idea that evil has a leg up. Good guys always finish last, right? Um, it's this idea that evil is so prevalent why even try to be good? <clears throat> but 
But that's what happens when we look at things from the world's lens. When we look at things using the world's paradigm, certainly it seems like good is, has the odds stacked against it. But the light from our wise Heavenly Father beams through the darkness, and it's going to give us some wise counsel. And it's going to give us uh, some good ideas for us to keep our minds set on, knowing that ultimately good overcomes. So Romans chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse 17. We need this wise and sage counsel from above. We need the light that shines through the darkness because we want to see things from God's perspective. We need His wisdom. And so what we're going to go over this evening is we're going to go over some really practical advice. You, you probably won't go home from tonight having some new, some brand new theological insight that you didn't have before you came here. But one of the things that I am hoping to do is I'm hoping to, get, to give you some encouragement, to give you some exhortation about how good can overcome evil. I'm hoping to give you some practical encouragement that we can make application with in our lives. Because we're all experiencing the things that this is going to talk about from 17 through the end of the chapter. This is real life where you're at. And that's my encouragement this evening. Romans 12 starting in verse 17. We're going to read 17 through 21 then we're going to break down each one of those verses individually. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we're going to start in verse 17 here. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Some important words in this sentence. First important word is never. That lets us know when it's appropriate for us to pay back evil for evil. Never. Okay? We can even make it two syllables if we need to, right? <clears throat> you make it as many syllables as you need to to get the point that you are never to repay back evil for evil to anyone. Another idea here is that God doesn't want us to pay back evil for evil. God wants us to do good even when evil is being done to us. God's perspective is not simply just for us to quit doing bad things. God's really interested in us putting on His character. He's interested in us being created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? He wants works to come from us. So, yeah, certainly never repay back evil for evil, but rather do good. So never, that tells us when we can, pay back evil for evil to anyone. To anybody. Well, that's pretty inclusive, isn't it? Yeah, but you don't know my boss. Yeah, but, but you don't know my coworker. Mm, but you don't know the guy that pulled out in front of me at the turnpike at the Shell station again. <clears throat> you don't know. Okay? You don't know my spouse. You, you, you don't know. Like, we can come up with all sorts of reasons and justifications, but those justifications fall short. 
Never repay back evil for evil to anyone. That means even in extreme cases when evil is being done to us, the appropriate response is not to do evil back. Never repay back evil for evil to anyone. God wants us to still practice the golden rule even when we are the ones who are being persecuted in extreme cases. Don't repay back evil for evil to anyone. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's going to give us more information on this. 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse 9. Well, let's, let's pick it up in 8, actually. To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Ah, so that's how God wants us to be. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So again, it's not just I refrained, I held myself back from doing that evil thing that I really wanted to do. But rather, to give a blessing instead. How can I turn this evil thing into a blessing. Well, guys, if you have tried this at all, this does not happen automatically. That's not your automatic response. Okay? It takes you controlling your mental environment to a great degree to be able to respond with a blessing when evil is being done to you. You have to already be in a place in your own head that is good and positive and healthy with the Word of God permeating it that when you experience evil being done to you, that your response is to give a blessing. If you don't have the Word indwelling in your heart okay, and in your mind, it's not going to happen. Probably the best thing that you can do at that point is just not return evil for evil. You don't have anything left to be able to give. Okay? Not returning evil for evil. That's why it's so important for us to control our um, to control our mental environment. Let's go to Philippians chapter four. See, all sorts of stuff is being made in the news and in politics about, you know, the environment, cleaning up the environment. I'd be happy to give you an opinion, not during my lesson, about some of that stuff. Um, but one of the things that I think that as Christians we don't think nearly enough about is our mental environment and making sure that that mental environment is clean. How... <clears throat> How full of life is our mental environment? How, how important is it that we make sure that no pollution is sinking in to our brains, but rather that we're having the real life, the rivers of living water permeating in our mental environment? Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace shall be with you. Man, that includes a whole lot of really good stuff. Whatever is true. Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is anything of excellent and anything worthy of praise, there's a lot of really good stuff that that would encompass, isn't there? 
there's a lot of great places for us to put our mind on to control our mental environment. Let's ask another question. If we just let autoplay go on YouTube, are you going to be receiving the things that are good, lovely, honorable? Let's ask another question. Is, is most of what's on Netflix good, true, honorable? Okay. We want to think about how we're controlling our mental environment. See, even in situations where we feel trapped, we actually have a whole lot more, we have a lot more choices than we sometimes realize that we do. I've been in situations where, you know, there's been mental environments where they're toxic in the workplace. And you're like, okay, well, what can I do about this? You know what, I had coworkers who would move their office space you might feel like, well, it's kind of drastic, but you know what? In your, your work situation is different than my work situation and other people's work situation. But you know what happened when my coworker approached my boss about moving his office space? He said, absolutely. No problem. I think a lot of times we psych ourselves out and be like, oh, well, that'd never work for me. Right? How hard are we really working in controlling our mental environment? We certainly can control our time off, right? I mean, we can control what we put on in our car radio. We can control what we turn on on the TV. We can control what we put into our mind. Those are all things that we can control, but there are even things that we can control that we might not realize that we can control. Tell you, tell you a quick story on myself a little bit. You guys are going to resonate with this. I... Uh, when I first started preaching in particular on a regular basis, I picked up this nasty habit of <clears throat> <clears throat> I do that all the time. And I do that all the time. One of the reasons why I do that is because I was listening to a lot of Jay Wilson preaching. Okay? You notice that Mark Miller does that quite a bit, but mine it was it was coming from from Jay's. Okay, and I, I told him, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm picking up these bad habits from you. And, and something that he said to me really stuck. He's like, you choose what you listen to. You choose what you listen to. See, do I have to pay attention to every time he's... <clears throat> That's my choice, really, isn't it? What I'm going to listen to? He wasn't telling me not to listen to him preaching, but what was I focusing on? Uh, could I work to, to cut that out from myself? Could I work to focus on the content and work to block out whenever I'm hearing, <clears throat> it's up to me, isn't it? I got a drink because I can't do that anymore. I have another one. I got. I got to tell on Brenna a little bit here. John Beeline, Michigan's head basketball coach, he has this habit of doing really weird stuff with his lips. Okay, so he's. I don't know if he's thinking. I don't. Know, I, don't I don't know if his dentures don't fit. I, I'm doing weird stuff with his lips all the time. And I told Brenna, I'm like, that's really bugs me. He does that. She's like, I had never seen it before. And now she can't unsee it. <laughs> She's like, I am so bad at you. <laughs> because now she sees it every single time that he's on the sideline. All you Michigan fans, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, but the point is, is what, what are we going to focus on? What are we going to put our mind on? We're going to put our mind on the things that are honest, true, and of good repute. Because if we do, we're going to have something in here by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the power of the Word of God. We're going to have something in here that there's enough in here to be able to give a blessing when evil is done to us. If 
our positive mental environment is not there, when evil is done to us, guess what? You don't have to give. It's just the way that this thing works. Back to Romans chapter 12. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Guys, right and good need our continuous support. The way in which a Christian shows that he really respects what is right is to practice what is right in the face of extreme pressure to do wrong. What we really believe is expressed by the way that we react when the pressure is turned up. You notice that there's, there's pressure on a number of different levels. We want to make sure that we are responding to that pressure by supporting that which is right. What's right in the sight of all men. That we're going to stand with those who do the right thing. We always find a way to kind of avoid it. You find a way to have another opinion. What we want to do is we want to stand with those who do the right thing. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. I'm going to take that, this in another direction too. This is not saying that other people get to determine what is right. No, God sets that standard. Let's go ahead and go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians eight, verse twenty-one. Second Corinthians eight twenty-one. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. See, we have regard for what is honorable in the sight of the Lord, and also in the sight of men. So our regard for what is honorable is the first, very first consideration is what does God think? That should determine what we think, right? What's God think? Okay. Guess what? He's right. <laughs> He's right. So, okay. But there's another level here that I think that we could think about, and certainly the rest of the scripture supports, is that doing what's right in the sight of all men. This ties in with not using our freedom as a covering to do evil. See, a sign, God really wants us to be effective in whatever situation that we're involved in. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. In verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who were without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I be, have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I might become a fellow partaker of it. Now, the principle here is pretty clear, but I want you to think about it from Paul's perspective just for a second. Look at what he's saying. In verse 21 in particular, I want you to think about this from Paul's perspective. To those who are without law as without law. Do you think that that was particularly easy or comfortable for the Apostle Paul, who is a Hebrew of Hebrews? who had great zeal for his ancestral traditions. To those who were without law, he became as without law. He was willing to sacrifice everything that he was comfortable with, everything that made him feel like, you know, this situation is right. 
I'm comfortable. This is what home is supposed to feel like. You know what I'm talking about. That place where your comfort zone is, right? He said, yeah. Being with, being with those who are without law, that's, without his, that's, that's outside of his comfort zone. But what he do? He became as those who were without law. That he might win, this, win uh, the more. What about those who were weak? Again, is, is Paul weak? No way in which you can classify Paul as weak. This guy is zealously passionate about everything that he does. He going to do it with strength. That guy was not going to back down. This is the guy who after he gets stoned and they leave him for dead, he comes marching right back into that same city where they all tried to kill him. That's the kind of strength of character that he has. And what's he willing to do? Those people who are weak in faith, those people that need the milk of the word, those people whose consciences are... He's, he's aware of that. He, he becomes weak for them. Okay? That's, <clears throat> that's what he's talking about. And so, it's really important as Christians that we become mature Christians. That we're not using our freedom as a covering that, I'll do whatever I want to do. There's, there's, <clears throat> there's freedom in Christ. Right? Then, that's childish, immature. Okay, Scripture here is saying, let's write in the sight of all men. Are we aware of the people around us and how what we're doing is affecting them? What are we communicating to them? Are we doing things so that we might by all means save some? Respect what's right in the sight of all men. Back to Romans 12. Verse 18, if possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. If possible. The reason why it says if possible here. When you're delivering a message of repent, people a lot of times respond with anger, Hatred, malice, violence towards you instead of humbly accepting what the Word of God has to say. People, well, let's look at John the Immerser, right? He's bringing forth a message of what? Repent! And, and what takes place? Well... Some high and mighty guys don't like it so much that his behavior is getting called out. So let's throw him in jail, and then let's have his head be brought to us on a platter. That's kind of what happens when we bring that message of repent. And that's the message that we're called to bring. So, guess what? Um, it was a little bit tough for John the, immer the Immerser to be at peace with those people because uh, they're not going to be at peace with him. Because he's not changing his message. Guys, we need to make sure that we don't change our message. No talking around it. No, no sheathing the sword of the word of God in rubber. It's intended to cut. Let it cut. The word of God is living and active and sharper than the two-edged sword. So you better not talk around what the word is actually saying says what it says. Does that have hard realities for people in their lives? You better believe it. It says what it says. Okay, We need to stand with that. And so, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. You know, you've been in this for very long. You probably have a story where, you know, you know somebody laid their hands on you, somebody put their finger in your face, somebody uh, escorted you you off their property with a gardening tool in their hand. <clears throat> you know, uh, you probably have some, you know, I've been there, okay? You probably have a story, okay? Because sometimes, 
people react pretty violently to the Word of God uh, being presented to them. So if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. There are times where it's not going to be possible. We don't want to take away from the thrust of this verse, though, because there's still some responsibility that we have. Be at peace with all men. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 26. God wants us to be at peace. We need to remember, God loves peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. What, we, what we're a part of is... Um, well, God wants us to have the peace of Christ in our hearts. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Okay, God wants us to have peace with him. He's worked really hard so that we can have reconciliation and peace with him and then peace with ourselves and peace with other people. Uh, we're to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. God's really interested in peace. Okay? He wants us to be a peaceful people. He wants us to be able to live lives uh, of quiet tranquility. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17. Like one who takes a dog by the ears is he who passes by and meddles with strife not belonging to him. As there is all sorts of strife that you can get yourself in the middle of if you're looking to do that. You can insert yourself and meddle in all sorts of strife. And doing that is like taking a big old Doberman Pinscher or Bull Mastiff by the ears. Okay, You're going to get something for that. Okay, you take, you take a Doberman you don't know by the ears, you, you get what you got coming to you. Or German Shepherd, or whatever. whatever. Yeah, you bit, right? And guess what happens when you meddle in strife that's not your own? Yeah, you bit. That's the way it's set up. That's why the scripture tells us very clearly if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Yeah, I realize that. Not every fight that you're invited to is a fight worth going to. And so make sure that you do everything that you can do to be at peace with all men. Last time I read, it said, blessed are the peacemakers. I think that's still in there, right? So <clears throat> let's, let's work to, to be at peace with all men. We have... You know, the Word of God, especially in our day and age, but just really the way that the Word of God is designed, you know, we have some controversial things to say. And I'm certainly not one to shy away from controversy. But I realize that I only have so much time, and I only have so much energy. And so the battles that I'm going to pick, those battles are going to mostly have to do with what the Word of God has to say. Because what other battles really matter? There are other things that I care about. There are things that I'm even passionate about. Sure. Those things matter in comparison with the Word of God. In a lot of ways, are they, are they worth fighting over? If possible, so far as depends on you, live at peace with all, <clears throat> with all men. Maybe you've got to choose for yourself what those things are. There's a number of different ways to be effective. I'm not telling you what you can and cannot take a stand for. But uh, think about what we're going to be what we're going to fight our battles uh, over. Back to Romans 12. Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord is the owner of vengeance. Vengeance is mine. Guys, you don't want to be in a position of trying to steal something that is the Lord's. That's not a good idea. He's the owner of it. So when he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, then it's really clear for us the delineation of responsibilities. He's responsible for vengeance. I'm not. Oh, 
okay, that's pretty clear, right? We all like it when our bosses are clear with us, right? And you don't want, like, <clears throat> muddy stuff. Like, I don't have any idea how I have to interpret that and I have to do it. That's tough, okay? Uh, well, God's pretty clear with us. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Okay, I guess I don't have to worry about vengeance then. That's above my pay grade. Thanks, God. Okay? And so we want to make sure that we are leaving room, leaving space for God's vengeance. Luke chapter 6 kind of gives us a delineation of our responsibilities. Let's check that out. Luke 6. Want to know what the Lord wants from us? Luke 6, verse 27. Luke 6, 27. Give me a second to get there. This is important. Luke 6, verse 27. But I say to you, who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. There's our responsibility. Bless, do not curse. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And leave the vengeance to God. Okay. Don't don't try to teach a lesson that's not your lesson to teach. We get ourselves in trouble that way. Kind of like kind of like messing with that dog. Right? Teach a lesson that's not ours to get to teach. Get ourselves bit, won't we? Now, there's gonna be a day of reckoning. Let's go to Isaiah chapter two. See, if God owns vengeance. Do you think he knows how to met it out? Do you think that he knows how justice ought to be served? Isaiah, the second chapter, starting in verse 12. For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning. Against everyone who is proud and lofty, and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, against all the beautiful craft, and the pride of man will be humbled." And the loftiness of man of men will be abased, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will completely vanish, and men will go into the caves of the rocks and into the holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord, and before the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. In that last day, men will be cast away to the moles and the bats, their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the hiffs, cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? There's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a day of vengeance. The Lord will met out justice. Don't try to do his job. You're not very good at it. Back to Romans chapter 12. But if your enemy, verse 20, is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. God wants us to have an internal sense of control. And that comes through the renewing of the mind so that we can maintain the positive outlook towards our enemies. He wants us to continually renew the mind to control again. One of the things we were coming back to is the, the positive mental environment. He wants us to work really hard to get that done so that 
okay, we can react this way even towards our enemies. That there's enough in our hearts to give generosity towards our enemy. Towards those who hate us. That's the kind of internal sense of control that God wants us to have. He always wants us to be mindful of the fact that each person is an eternal soul. Each person's going to live forever. Guys, we're familiar, okay? Something really bad happens, and the, a common phrase is, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, right? We've all heard that? Wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy? I think that there's some truth to that, even within non-Christian base man in his best moments realizes that I really wouldn't want anybody else to go through this. Well, some fleshly men really would like other people to go through that, but that's a them problem, okay? As Christians, ah, yeah, I don't want anybody else to go through it. You know what we don't want for anybody? We don't want for anybody the hellfire. No, nobody, nobody uh, we shouldn't desire that for anybody. So what we have to keep in, in mind is in the here and now, in the day-to-day, -day, when we have enemies that are doing uh, evil towards us, to recognize that they have an eternal soul. And that that is a reality for each and every one of us, that they have an eternal soul. So how are we going to impact that? Are we going to impact their eternal soul for good? Or <clears throat> are we going to push them along their way uh, towards uh, a not very pleasant eternity. Be the type of people that even when our enemy is suffering, that we have compassion. That when they're hungry, we feed them. That when we're thirsty, we give them a drink. Now this phrase will heap burning coals upon his head. This phrase has been discussed and postulated and debated for a really long time. You can kind of come to your own conclusion about what is specifically being referenced. But what we know must be being referenced for sure is that this attitude is one of help, not harm. Our motivation can't be, I want this person to have burning coals heaped upon their head. So, you know, I'm going to give them a cup of water so that they'll suffer. Okay? We know contextually that can't be what this is talking about. It needs to come from a motive of help, not harm. Again, what it's specifically talking about, you can kind of come to your own conclusion. I'll share something that I read. No idea if it's correct or not, but help me think about this passage in a different way. It said, heaping coals of fire, their opinion is derived from a crucible where they heaped on, where they heaped coals on the hard metal until it melted. Okay, heaping burning coals on the head of the hard metal until it melted. Well, isn't that really what God wants us to do in feeding those who are hungry, uh, our enemy who is thirsty, giving him a drink? Doesn't he want us to have that ember of life so that they can be softened to the gospel. So that they're going to be receptive, that our kindness can help soften them to give them the gospel message. That's really what we want to do. Now, what they choose to do with it is up to them, right? What our enemy chooses to do, they could be softened towards the gospel, or they, they could use it to, um, you know, hurry themselves uh, down their path to eternal destruction. That's, that's their choice, but our motivation needs to be one uh, of help, not harm. Um, this is being quoted from Proverbs, the 25th chapter. Let's go ahead and go back there, because there's one line that's not given in the New Testament that's going to be helpful for us here, too. Proverbs 25. Verse 21, Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. See, 
Our motivation needs to be one of help, not harm. And our motivation needs to be one of working for the Lord, not working for man. The Lord will reward you. Again, we're storing up for ourselves eternal treasures based upon the things that we do here on the earth. In the here and now, okay, when we're in the moment, it can be really difficult to see other people as eternally valuable souls. But that's the only way that we're going to respond appropriately when we are offended, when we are wronged, when our enemies are treating us in ways that we don't deserve to be treated. Finally, last verse of Romans chapter 12. <coughs> Romans 12. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil. See, this is written here, again, for our instructions. For our instruction, it is possible for evil to wear on a Christian long enough that he eventually gives up. It's possible. It says, don't. Don't be overcome by evil. Don't let it wear on you. But you overcome evil with good. See, a Christian can, Christian can be worn down. He can decide, hey, if you can't beat them, join them. Okay? It's not the attitude that we're to have. We're to be the type of people who overcome. And that's why our Heavenly Father interjects hope into our lives by pointing out that good can eventually overcome evil. You just got to work the process. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good wins in the end. Good wins. Are you faithful enough to stay on the winning side? Make sure that that's the type of people that we are. I don't want to go through, run, run the race of Christianity, give out on the end, and end up on the losing side. I want to overcome evil with good. What's going to take us renewing our minds today so that instead of being like the world and becoming involved in the circle of evil for evil, we can break the cycle and overwhelmingly conquer by doing good. We do good. That's who we are. We, we live out a new creation culture that responds to evil with good. If you turn back just a couple pages to Romans 8.37. I'll read this first, and then we can stand up, and we'll have a prayer. Romans 8, verse 37. <clears throat> but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Stand up. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that we can uh, overcome evil uh, with good. You are uh, the source of good. You indwell us, Lord God, and our strength comes from you. I'm thankful that we can win and we can overcome evil with good and let your sh light shine to others so that they can also become part of the winning team. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.